All right, so um, welcome everyone. Today we will be presenting for the Valley Health Virtual Health Fair. Um, and my name is Dr. Brittany Shepherd. I am a current pharmacist and I am accompanied today by Dr. Eric Scott and Dr. Sarah Pardon-Pichu Wade. Um, and the topic we're gonna be covering today is our toolkit for diabetes care. So some objectives or things that we're gonna look over today during the presentation are defining diabetes and how your body regulates sugar, reviewing high and low blood sugar causes, symptoms, and treatment, outlining some common lifestyle modifications, discuss the medications used to treat diabetes, summarizing the common complications and necessary comprehensive care, and then allowing time for any questions we may have. So a little bit of background about diabetes, we're gonna start with what is diabetes? By definition, it is a condition in which the body doesn't make or use insulin correctly. So when I'm trying to explain this to my patients, I like to use this graphic because I think it really simplifies things and breaks it down for you. So in all patients and all people, we eat our food and it is digested into sugar molecules in our blood. So the sugar is represented by these yellow or gold dots and the blue represents our blood. This sugar needs to get into our cells to be used for energy. Um, so the way that we do that is insulin unlocks the cell and lets that sugar in. So in a person with no diabetes, our body makes enough insulin. We don't have any problem with insulin working and that sugar automatically can go into the cells it needs to and we don't see high blood sugar. In everyone, insulin is made in our pancreas cells here, these beta cells. And so in type one diabetes, it is an autoimmune condition. So the body's attacking itself and specifically these cells here in the pancreas. So type one diabetes, you're not able to make insulin or you're not able to make enough insulin for your body's requirements. And that's why our type one diabetics require insulin treatment. In type two diabetes, more often than not, it's a problem with this lock, which we refer to as insulin resistance. So your body may be making the insulin, but it's not really using it appropriately. And so that's why we use medications, which will kind of go over things like our metformin, um, medications that make your body more sensitive to the insulin it may be making. Over time in type two diabetes, if your body's making the insulin and the sensitivity is the problem or we're resistant to that insulin, these pancreas cells will kind of increase the amount of insulin they're making. So they're like, well, our sugar is still high. We obviously need more insulin. And so they'll make more and they'll make more and they'll make more, um, even though the lock is the problem. So sometimes in type two diabetes, these cells get burnt out. We call that beta cell burnout and they get tired. And so then they eventually won't be able to make all the insulin that you need. Um, so sometimes you do notice that type two diabetics also require insulin therapy. So the first thing to cover here is hyperglycemia, which is also known as high blood sugar. So some causes of high blood sugar are things like skipping a dose of your medication. If you eat more than usual, especially those carbohydrates, if you're less active than usual, being stressed or sick, um, and then some other medications that you may take may also cause your blood sugar to be high. Some signs and symptoms you may be having a high blood sugar are things like very thirsty, needing to go to the bathroom often, hungry, sleepy, you could have some blurry vision, or you could notice that your infections or injuries are healing more slowly than usual. On the opposite side there, we have hypoglycemia or low blood sugar. And this is defined as a blood sugar of less than 70 for regular low, or if it's less than 50, that's considered a severe low. So some causes of that would be things like skipping or delaying your meals, taking too much medication, taking certain medicines without eating enough, if you're more active than usual, or drinking some alcohol can sometimes cause a low blood sugar. So some signs and symptoms you may have with low blood sugar are things like being shaky or sweaty or dizzy. You could get confused or have some difficulty speaking, hungry, weak or tired, some headache, or some nervous or upset. So different patients will experience different symptoms, and even some patients might not experience symptoms at all. So we don't like when our patients have low blood sugars, but we do like when you have signs and symptoms because it's kind of your body's alarm saying, hey, we need to fix this because our blood sugar is going too low. So what do we do if our blood sugar goes too low? We treat it using the rule of 15. So first thing, you have those signs and symptoms, you check your blood sugar. 
If your blood sugar is less than that 70 mark, we're going to treat it with 15 grams of a quick acting sugar and recheck our blood sugar again in 15 minutes. So that's that rule of 15. So 15 grams of sugar are some of the things listed here, something like glucose tablets. So three or four of those tablets you can buy over the counter at the pharmacy, a tablespoon of honey, a tablespoon of sugar mixed with water. More commonly, we ask our patients to do like half a cup or two thirds of a cup of juice or regular soda. It's the only time we're gonna recommend that our diabetics have juice or regular soda, but it will spike that blood sugar up. And so that's what we use for treatment. And once you recheck that in 15 minutes, if you notice your blood sugar is above 70, then you can eat a small snack or your next meal to sustain that. But if you notice when you check in 15 minutes, it's still less than 70, you wanna repeat that process again. So drink another half a cup of juice and check again in 15 minutes until it is above that mark. Um, I also noted here at the bottom, glucagon is something that can be prescribed to patients and it's kind of like the EpiPen of diabetes. So you only want to use the glucagon if it's an emergent situation. So the patient is unconscious or they're unable to treat themselves um, or you're unable to give them like the juice or something like that. So it's kind of like the emergency shock of sugar to your system that will bring your blood sugar up. So what things can affect our blood sugar? I really use this graphic just to let you know there are so many different factors that go into how our blood sugar functions. This one, um, I believe 42 factors. Um, so different things to consider are things like the foods we're eating, the amount of foods we're eating, when we're eating them, how hydrated we are, um, your medication dose, when you take your medication, other medications you may be taking that could affect your blood sugar, um, your activity levels, and then um, other kind of patient specific factors, like you didn't get enough sleep or you're stressed or sick or all kinds of different things like that can affect your blood sugar. So I like to really show this graphic to let you know that it's not as simple as just the food you're eating and just the medicines you're taking. There are a very um, diverse number of things that can contribute to what your blood sugar looks like at any point in time. So for patients with diabetes and then patients that don't, kind of the way we would diagnose them is taking a hemoglobin A1C. So um, regularly patients will get monitored for their A1C to determine um, how their blood sugar is looking. And so your A1C is a representation of three month average of your blood sugar. And why it's a three month average, we're looking at hemoglobin, so your red blood cells. So they have a life of about three months. So if we check in on how they're doing, that tells us what your blood sugar looked like over the past three months. Um, so this is kind of a graphic here that represents, based on what your A1C comes back as, um, theoretically what your blood sugars are probably looking like. So if you, your A1C comes back at 9%, that lets us know that those finger stick blood glucoses that you're checking are probably around the 212 mark on average. So some goals in our patients with diabetes, in most otherwise healthy adults, um, our A1C goal is going to be less than 7%. And then that means that our fasting numbers are the numbers you check first thing in the morning. We want to be somewhere between 80 and 130 and those after meal values less than 180. But as you can see over here, there are a couple of different things that we take into consideration when we're setting your A1C goal. So things like how long you've had diabetes, your risks for having lows or interactions with your other drugs. If you have other disease states going on, um, any kind of cardiovascular complications or patient preference, and then also kind of like resources and support system. So your goal could be a little bit more strict or a little bit less strict, depending on those kind of things that are present. So for treatment, we're going to do just a brief overview today. So everyone has a good idea of what we have in our diabetes toolkit. So first we're going to cover lifestyle modifications, and those are things like weight loss. So it is recommended that patients lose about 5% of their body weight through diet, physical activity, and behavioral therapy. And the way that we do this is if we reduce our weekly caloric intake by around 3,500 kilocalories, so like 500 calories a day, it will result in about one pound of weight loss per week. So nutrition, things that we want to consider for our nutrition when diabetes is involved, 
for type one, since those patients don't make insulin, they will be expected to count their carbohydrates. So that way they can give themselves the amount of insulin they need for the carbohydrates that they're eating. In type two diabetes, it's a little bit different. And since our bodies typically make some insulin, we just need to be more aware of the carbohydrates we're having. So kind of the goal there would be less than 30 grams per meal of carbohydrates for females and less than 45 grams per meal in males. And that's going to be, I want to emphasize that is per meal. That's not for the entire day, um, but that's how many carbohydrates you want to stick near for um, our goals there. And then you may have heard about previously the plate method. Um, so very simplified version of that. Here is our plate. And ideally at each meal, you want your plate to be made half of non-starchy vegetables. So those green leafy vegetables and things like that. One quarter of your plate to be some kind of meat or other protein. So things like nuts or cheeses or eggs are another source of protein aside from meat. And then one quarter of our plate, we want to keep as that carbohydrate or those starchy vegetables. So things like our potatoes, our pasta, bread, rice, those kind of things. We want to limit to one quarter of the plate. And I always like to point out, we are limiting it. We're not completely eliminating it. Um, so as long as we're aiming for those 30 and 45 goals, um, we can still incorporate carbohydrates into our diet. Um, other lifestyle modifications we can do for alcohol. It is recommended um, that females have no more than one drink per day and males are having no more than two drinks per day. And for physical activity, um, we want to attempt to decrease our sedentary stints. So those are times that you're not spent being active um, and get up and move at least once every 30 minutes. And that can be just a little walk around the room or just get yourself moving. And then we recommend 150 minutes of moderate intensity exercise per week spread across at least three days. So commonly we see this as 30 minutes a day, five days a week or something like that. And it's also recommended that flexibility and balance training be performed in older adults to kind of keep you sharp and keep you healthy. Finally, smoking cessation. So if you are a current smoker um, or user of tobacco, kind of quitting that and um, talking to your pharmacist or your doctor about ways to kind of help you do that will overall improve your diabetes as well. So medications that we have in our toolbox for diabetes, we have oral agents and we have injectable agents. So for our oral agents, there are a couple different medication classes, which we will talk about the meds that fall in each of those. We have our biguanides, our SGLT2 inhibitors, our DPP4 inhibitors, sulfonylureas, and TZDs for lack of not pronouncing that word. And then for our injectable therapy, we have two options. We have our GLP-1 receptor agonist, and then we have our different insulins that we can use. So our first medication that we typically go to when patients are diagnosed with diabetes is metformin. It is our most common, and we know that it works, and that's why we like to use it. So it falls in the class of medications called biguanide. So that medication we use there is our metformin. And how it works is it lowers your blood sugar by decreasing that hepatic glucose production and increasing your insulin sensitivity. So it decreases the amount of glucose that we're making and then also makes our body more sensitive to the insulin that we do have or that we're giving. Some common side effects with metformin. Um, the most common one we have is GI upset. So you may get some diarrhea, nausea, or vomiting when you're taking the next class of medications we have is our sodium glucose trans co-transporter 2 or our SGLT2 inhibitors. So these are medications like Jardiance, Farsiga, Invocana, and Staglotro. And how they work are they increase your urinary excretion of glucose. So simplified, they help you pee out the extra sugar that's in your blood. So some common side effects of this would be that increased urination and and then because we are peeing out excess sugar, we also need to watch for increased risk of UTIs or yeast infections. Um, of note with these medications, they've been doing a lot more studies recently. And these medicines have proven not only to help with blood sugar, but they've also have a heart protecting benefit and a kidney protecting benefit in certain situations. So um, overall, this is a very good class of medications to be on. Um, kind of the downside to a lot of our diabetes medications are the cost. Um, so this is more of an expensive uh, class of medications, but there are ways we can kind of work around that and make sure that you are able to take them. 
The next class of medications we have are the glucagon-like peptide receptor agonists. Um, and so these are one of the injectable classes I was talking about. And they work by reducing the sugar that's released, increasing the glucose-dependent insulin secretion, and decreasing your gastric motility, which keeps you fuller for longer and can promote some weight loss. So these medications are things like our Bidurian, our Victoza, our Trulicity, and Ozempic. So all of the medications are listed here. Those are kind of the common ones that we see. Um, and these are injectable medications. Some of them are daily injectables, while others you can get an injection that you only take once weekly. So some common side effects of these um, you do notice some transient nausea. So that means when you first start taking the medicine, it might make you a little bit nauseous, but as your body gets used to it, that nausea typically goes away. Um, you also could see some injection site reactions. You are injecting yourself. So you may have a little bit of redness or stinging or things like that, especially when you first start using it. And then another common side effect, you may get a headache. It's reported in some patients. Um, just like with our SGLT2 inhibitors, this class also has proven not only to help with your blood sugar, but also um, protecting your heart. So it does have some of that cardiac benefit with certain ones of these agents. Our next class is our dipeptidyl peptidase 4, so DPP4 inhibitors. And these are medications like Genuvia, Trigenta, Onglyza, and Nisenia. And how these work is very similar to the GLP ones we just talked about, but a little bit less intense. Um, and this is an oral agent, so um, it's a pill that you would take once a day. Some common side effects of these medications are upper respiratory infections, and then once again, those GI effects like diarrhea, nausea, or vomiting. Another class of medications we have are our sulfonylureas, or SUs. Um, and those are medications like glomepiride, glipizide, and gliburide. And these medications work by stimulating the insulin that's released from your, bank, your pancreatic beta cells, reducing that glucose output from the liver, and increasing your insulin sensitivity. So we kind of look at this as like pushing the gas pedal on the pancreas to make those cells pump out some more insulin. So that's how this medication will work. Some common side effects you may see from this, um, since it is directly increasing the amount of insulin you produce, you could see some hypoglycemia or those low blood sugars. It also could cause a little bit of weight gain and it could cause some GI upset. So things like our nausea or vomiting. Our next class are the TZDs. Um, and these medications work by increasing our peripheral muscle glucose uptake and reducing the glucose output from the liver. Um, so the main medication we have in this class that we use today is pioglitazone or Actos as the brand name. And some common side effects of this medication are things like edema, so fluid retention. Um, so if you are a patient with heart failure, this is a medication we would like to avoid in you. And then weight gain, um, part of that is because of that fluid retention, you might see some weight gain. Uh, it also has a delayed onset. So once you start taking this medication, it takes around four to 12 weeks before you see the full effect of the medication. Um, so if we're looking for something that's going to act really quickly, this isn't going to be our go-to. And then very rare side effects, but also worth mentioning, this medication can be toxic to the liver. Um, it can contribute to some bladder cancer and can increase your risk of fractures. So the last class of medicines we're going to talk about are the insulins. So the way that insulin works is it basically mimics what insulin does in our body. So we're just giving ourselves that insulin. So insulin signals the liver to convert glucose to glycogen and prevent glycogen breakdown when your blood sugar is high after eating. It is required for glucose uptake by those cells. So used for energy, like that first picture we pointed out, we use the insulin to get that sugar into the cells. It also is responsible for regulating fat storage in your adipose tissue, so that fat tissue, um, and converts excess glucose to fat and prevents that fat breakdown for energy. So insulin does a lot. Um, so whenever you're taking insulin, it's basically giving yourself what your body isn't able to produce or not able to use efficiently. So some common insulins we have, there are different kinds of insulin. We have our long acting insulins, which typically will be given once a day, maybe twice a day. And those are things like Basaglar, Orlantis, Tegeo, Traceba, Levamir. 
We have another class of insulins called the intermediate insulins. And these are things you might have been referred to as NPH. So medications like Humulin N or Novolin N. Another class we have is our rapid acting insulin. You might have heard of it referred to as mealtime insulin. So those mealtime insulins we have are things like Admalog, Humalog, Lumjev, Fios, Novolog, or Apidra. And then our last class of insulin we have is regular or short acting insulin. Um, and that would also be considered maybe a mealtime insulin that you would be on. And typically the in insulin is just called insulin regular, but you may see it as brand names like Humulin R or Novolin R without R there standing for regular. So the side effects of insulin, since it is something that naturally occurs in our body, it doesn't really have very many side effects, but it can cause low blood sugar um, and it can cause some weight gain. The final thing to note about insulin, some of our insulins come in concentrated formulations, which all that means is it allows for you to administer a larger dose of insulin with giving yourself less volume. So it's easier for your body to absorb. Um, so insulin is always dosed in units. Um, so if you look here kind of in this picture, a U100 insulin would have 100 units in this amount of volume whereas a U500 insulin will be able to give you 100 units, but by giving you a smaller amount. Um, so you would still take the number of units that you are prescribed, but whenever you are injecting it, you're gonna be giving yourself less volume, so less milliliters of insulin at one time. And there's a couple different um, insulins that do come in these concentrated versions. So things like Humalog U200, the Lumjev U200, our Humulin R does come in a U500. That medication works a little bit differently. So um, if you are on that, your doctor will kind of talk to you about that. And then for our long acting, we have Traceba, which comes as a U200 into JL, which comes as a U300. So the most important thing to take from this are there are other kinds of insulins um, or different formulations of insulin that we can give if you're on high doses, so you don't have to inject so much volume at a time. So the last thing we're gonna talk about today are complications and comprehensive care for diabetes. So diabetes is the leading cause of blindness, in-stage renal disease, and non-traumatic amputations. So it can be fairly serious um, if you have elevated blood sugar for a long period of time. So some microvascular complications we would see are things like retinopathy, so problems with our eyes, increased risk of cataracts and glaucoma. You could see some diabetic kidney disease, which could eventually progress to end-stage renal disease if it's not managed. You could also see peripheral neuropathy. So that's when those nerves in your feet, you could get numbness or tingling um, or pain. And that does increase your risk of foot infections and amputations. And then finally, for microvascular complications, we could see autonomic neuropathy. So those are things like erectile dysfunction, gastroparesis, loss of bladder control, or urinary tract infections. Our macrovascular complications that we're worried about are things like coronary artery disease, so those heart attacks or chest pain. Our cerebrovascular disease, so things like transit ischemic attacks or strokes, and then peripheral artery disease. So the things that we do to kind of make sure we're participating in comprehensive care and covering for any of those things, we can recommend antiplatelet therapy. So treatment with aspirin, 81 milligrams, so a baby aspirin is recommended daily for secondary prevention. So that means if you've already had a heart attack or you know you have coronary artery disease, we want you to be taking a baby aspirin to kind of prevent that from happening in the future. Um, it's also recommended in pregnancy to reduce the risk of preeclampsia and can be considered if you're at high risk of developing some of those cardiovascular complications, um, but that's a good conversation to have with your doctor or your pharmacist. For cholesterol control, um, we wanna make sure we're getting a fasting lipid panel whenever you're diagnosed with diabetes, and then every five years after that, unless we start or change your cholesterol medication. And then in that case, we do need to get a little bit more frequent monitoring. For blood pressure, we want to make sure we're controlling our blood pressure. So some goals are likely going to be um, less than 130 over 80, but it could be a little bit less strict at less than 140 over 90. 
For the other complications we want to watch for would be that neuropathy, nephropathy, which is our kidneys. Um, so we want to get an annual urine albumin creatinine ratio. Um, so that's kind of the urine test that your doctor may order for you to get. And we kind of look at that and see um, if that number is greater than 30, we might consider adding an agent on to keep those kidneys healthy. For neuropathy or that nerve pain, um, we will recommend yearly foot exams done by your provider um, or podiatrist or whoever you're seeing, but some doctor, we want them to check your feet once a year. And then daily self exams are also recommended. So you should take a look at your own feet every day just to see, do you still have all your sensations in your feet? Do you notice any numbness or tingling or pain? Um, and then if you have any infections um, or injuries or cuts or scrapes or blisters on your feet, are those healing appropriately or do, are they something that we want to get checked out? If you do have diagnosed neuropathy, um, there are a couple medications that we can offer um, for treatment. Um, but that's going to be something that your doctor would have to prescribe to you. And then we have retinopathy. So those problems that we can have with our eyes, that's why we recommend that yearly you get a dilated comprehensive eye exam. Um, and also of note here, our pregnant women are at higher risk. So we definitely want to make sure we're monitoring that as well. And then finally, our vaccinations. Um, I've listed just a couple here that are important for our patients with diabetes, um, but make sure that you are getting the recommended vaccination. So your annual flu shot, and um, you should be getting a tetanus shot about every 10 years. Hepatitis B, you may be a good candidate for that. Um, your pneumonia shot, especially that Pneumovax 23 is recommended, and then as well as the shingles vaccine. That is all the information that I have to share today. Are there any questions about anything that I went over or any questions about diabetes in general? All right, so hearing no questions now, I will go ahead and provide our contact information if any questions come up later that you guys may have. Feel free to reach out. Once again, my name is Brittany Shepard um, and I'm the first email address listed here. If you have any questions you want to send me or if you um, are uncomfortable sending your questions via email, you can shoot me an email. We can set up a phone call or a meeting to kind of discuss anything. Um, you can also reach out to Dr. Eric Scott and Dr. Sarah Parnapi, and their email addresses are provided here as well. These are my references. Primarily, we looked at the American Diabetes Association recommendations. Um, but if there are, like I said, any questions, um, you can feel free to reach out to these email addresses and we'll be able to kind of help you out to the best of our abilities. Um, thank you guys so much for attending today or taking the time to watch this video. Um, I want to make sure that everyone knows everything about diabetes that they can to kind of make their best choices and uh, manage that the best way possible. If you have any other questions um, specific to your own health and you don't want to ask us, feel free to go to your physician and ask them any questions um, or your local pharmacist, whether that be in your doctor's office or at your community pharmacy. Um, we are pretty knowledgeable um, with the medications and we could uh, help you out in that way as well.